Welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. It's such a pleasure today to be here with Luz Reyes Martin, who's always got so much buzz around her. <laughs> everyone, you know, for a long time, everyone I talk to and her name comes up, it's always Luz, Luz, Luz is so great. Luz is wonderful. She's fantastic. And you do so many things in the community. And you're definitely uh, somebody who's had a lot of impact. And everybody's always wondering, how far is Luce going to go in this political <laughs> world? So uh, we're going to have a good conversation today. Luce, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you for taking some time. This is our second go around. You were one of my original guests when we were audio only. So yeah. it's so nice to be able to do it in this form as well today. So Luce, let's dive right in. You are running for District 1 on the Goleta City Council. And I want to ask you about that and why you're running and what the issues are and just sort of give us an idea of what's important to you as you pursue this spot. Yeah, great. Well, again, you know, I'm so glad to to join you. It was really fun to be part of one of the first couple of folks when it was an audio podcast. And it's been really great to see the evolution, you know, over over time. And, you know, I'm one of those folks that tunes in to, to listen to all different kinds of topics, whether it's music or parenting or other community mm -hmm. issues. It's a it's a great fun show. Thank you. Um, well, you know, for the last eight years, I've served on the Goleta School Board. Um, and I was first appointed uh, to the board uh, because there was a vacancy um, in 2014. Um, and then I was elected at large um, to two terms after that um, in November of 2014 and then in 2018. Um, and during that time, you know, it's been just really great and fulfilling work. Uh, I've been elected by my colleagues twice to serve as board president, and I've really worked hard to strengthen the district and really to serve students um, and teachers and staff and families um, and community members. You know, I think there's so much that a school district brings to a community, even if you're not a parent or a teacher or, or directly involved with, with the schools. And I think in addition to my, you know, elected service, I've been really active in just other community service groups, working on advocacy issues, or serving on nonprofit boards. and But really, the bottom line is I love Goleta. Um, I think it's why I love being involved in so many things. It's just a wonderful community. Um, and like others, I followed the redistricting process closely that the city went through. Um, and in looking at, you know, what those final maps look like, um, I know I have a strong connection to the newly created District 1, uh, mm -hmm. which is roughly, you know, that northeast corner um, on the mountainside <laughs> of Goleta. Mm -hmm. And the people of this district, you know, my neighbors, their, their parents, we've got lots of kids, working families, grandparents, uh, uh, retirees, and other working professionals. Um, I know that they're, they're teachers, they're nurses, they're first responders, they work in a lot of our local companies. Um, and I decided to run for city council because I believe in public service. I want to make a positive difference right here in our community. And I think I have a lot to contribute. Uh, you know, I think I've shown a solid track record of being practical, being pragmatic, working together with other people, and ultimately being effective. I think I have a lot of broad and diverse experience, you know, both professionally and, you know, in my volunteer work that I think positions me really well to have an immediate impact um, on the district and really the city as a whole. Um, I'm running a grassroots campaign that's really focused on talking directly with voters on the issues that are important to them and what they want to see in the future of our city. Um, and that's why I've spent all summer knocking on doors um, and talking with residents. And I'll really focus on that and continue to do that all the way to election day. Wow, that's that's amazing. And you've done such a great job on the Goleta School Board. So now you're going to have an opportunity to, to work on some overlapping issues and some new issues and represent District 1. You know, uh, you, you do have an opponent and we'll talk about um, him in a second, but Talk to me a little bit about Goleta and, and what that is. We know that Santa Barbara gets a lot of political attention, but Goleta is really this fantastic community. You know, we have this name of, it's the good land, of course, but we're also a, a tech hub. We have so many tech businesses in Absolutely. this community. 
And uh, we have Camino Real Market Center. It's like this really vibrant shopping area. And we have Target. And, you know, we're trying to get more more, more park space. But, you know, in Old Town, we have Recent Park. And, of course, we have a lot of new housing that's been it was approved a while ago. And that's come online. And we do have incredible housing needs in the community. And Galea is a really good, you know, uh, uh, working class family community. If you have kids, it's definitely a place where you can build a network and and build a family yeah. and it's also a millennial you know gen z hub too you know it's there's so much for everybody but talk to me about galita and like what what you love about it and if you are elected what are the things you would like to uh improve make better well i think you captured so much of what makes galita really special um and uh you know i think i i, I don't realize how much i really love this community until i have visitors come over whether it's friends or family and i'm just always talking about galita and how great this community is and they're like wow there's a lot there's a lot here um you know i think people think of the central coast and they think of you know the bigger cities santa barbara or san luis obispo or wine you know the wine parts of the county um and this is truly just this special community and i think what really uh encapsulates that for me is being on the school board you know i always say that there's nothing more personal than your kids and their education um, so being on a school board, especially when you're having to work on issues where there might not be, you know, a consensus on, on how to do something or the opinions about something, or it's something that affects someone's, you know, child, uh, you really have to be able to sit down and hear people out, hear lots of different perspectives, um, and, and be, you know, both diplomatic, but also just truly genuine in, in hearing people out. Um, and I think that's what's really special about Galita is that over the last eight years, I've probably had hundreds of coffee meetings at, you know, Starbucks or, you know, Old Town Coffee since it's been in place or the coffee bean or, or, at, the, or at a playground uh, where parents will come and bring their kids while we talk. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter what their background is, no matter how they might feel or where they land, you know, on a political spectrum, I really prioritize sitting down and just talking things out um, as one parent to another, as a community member to another, hearing out their concerns, sharing, you know, information that I might, you know, contribute that they might not know about maybe the whole picture about an issue. Yeah. I think that's what really makes Galita special is that we're a small enough tight knit community where we can do that. Um, and where, uh, you know, I really think it's, you know, a responsibility of an elected uh, individual in any role um, to put that time in, um, to, to really do that direct, you know, constituent service. But I really think it's just meeting people and, and, and talking things out. Um, to me, I think that's what really makes Galita special. It's how we can tackle problems together. We can talk to each other, not at each other. Um, and more more times than not, come to some kind of, um, you know, if it's not consensus, at least recognizing that, you know, all, you know, points of view have been heard and that there's an, an explanation of how we've come to a decision um, and we can move on and still have mutual respect for each other. Yeah. Great. Well, well said. Well put. Um, it is an amazing place. I'm looking for the Lemon Festival uh, returning after yeah, the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I got my, them, my kids their wristbands for the all the activities. They're yeah, really my, my daughter it. loves it. When we saw the sign on uh, Stork, she's like, it's coming back, you know. So yeah. we're gonna go to the, and go to the Lemon Run, too. The Lemon Run? Is that uh, is that involved running, Luce? I don't know. There's a 1K family <laughs> okay. walk that oh, okay. we're doing. Okay. All right. That's all right. That's not, that sounds good. <laughs> it benefits the Galita Education Foundation. Oh, okay. Great. Um, I'll, I'll go to that um, after the the pie eating contest. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about specifically the Galita Council race. You're running in District One against Roger Seves. He's been there what, four terms, I think, uh, very long time, and uh, he's running for re-election. There are no term limits in Galita. And I wanted to just sort of ask you, and I know you're a pro, you know, I know you're not going to say anything that's, um, you know, unseemly or, you know, attacking, but as much as you can, can you talk a little bit about why a change is needed? I mean, Roger's a, 
He's a good guy, you know. He's a Democrat. He's he's not progressive, but he is a Democrat. Uh, why do we need a change? Well, what I think is really exciting about this race, and you know, this is what I've been talking about when I, I I'm out knocking on doors, um, is for the first time, uh, my neighbors and the residents of District One get to elect our own council representative, who's going to be directly accountable to you know the specific needs of of our neighborhoods and our community. Um, and I think that's really exciting. Um, and so I'm running because I believe voters should have a choice. Um, and I'm presenting my background and my experience and you know my fresh perspective on the issues the city's facing. I have a lot of respect for 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 Roger, but I'm focused on my campaign and my message. Uh, but I will say, you know, generally, when I'm talking to residents, um, you know, I hear so much, you know, won't be surprising how much people love Goleta. I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I also hear about, you know, the things that they're worried about or, or concerns that they have. Um, they want to see us do more to address bicycle and pedestrian safety. Uh, they want to see more action to address climate change that is really focused locally. Um, like preparing us for the threat of wildfires, addressing our energy issues, uh, working more collaboratively with the water district. Uh, they respect and want more connections with our first responders to address public safety issues, whether that's our firefighters or our sheriff's deputies. Uh, they want to see roads improve. They want more parks and rec opportunities. They want to talk openly and honestly about how we're going to address our housing needs while carefully planning for the impacts that that brings and giving residents an opportunity to talk that out and give input. Um, I think those are really the issues that are most prevalent in, in the district and I think in a lot of cases throughout the city. Um, and so I'm focused on, you know, what I want to see with with those issues, how I want to work to represent our community. Um, and, you know, I think that I'm the best choice to address those issues, to to work collaboratively with residents and the rest of the council and our regional partners, because Goleta is, is wonderful, but we're not an island. We can't do everything on our own. We do have to work, you know, regionally. Um, and I think I have that experience and the enthusiasm and the commitment to just get things done and to communicate back to residents about what's going on um, and to really just work hard um, on behalf of, of my constituents. Um, so that's really what, what I'm focused on. You know, I want to present, you know, you know what I want to bring um, and have voters decide. Yeah. Okay. Well, good, good. Well said. I, I'm just sort of stretching that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, you and I are both Mexican Americans, and you're you um you know have an you have an incredible story. We're going to talk about a little bit later, but we talk about diversity. Diversity is important to you. Um, it's important to so many people here. Um, you know, in Santa Barbara, in California, in terms of representation, and so uh, you and, and diversity means a lot of things. You know, so but in this context, you know, you are a Latina running for office against a uh, sitting. Uh, Hispanic Latino candidate on, uh, you know, on, on who's serving. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of diversity and what that means in these leadership positions? Uh, it's, it's obviously important that you have a community of uh, electeds who represent the community on the ground, you know, so they yeah. look like each other, um, you know, so in some ways it's kind of a bummer that um, one way or other, you know, we're still only going to have, you know, at least, um, you know, well, you know, for this race, you know, we're going to either have Luis or Roger. We're not going to have two uh, members of the Latino Latinx community on, on, you know, at least, you know, both of you specifically serving. And can you talk a little bit about that? Is it bittersweet that for you to get on, Roger has to leave? Um, isn't, isn't it great? Maybe, you know, as, as minorities, as ethnic minorities, like it always feels like, you know, we have to settle for one or two, right? But it's, it's, like, why can't, you know, one or two is not enough, right? Why is four, four out of five, you know, or something like that. <laughs> you know, so, but can you talk about representation and do you feel anything about, you know, maybe you're going to oust Roger, the one Mexican American who's been serving Galita on the council for the last, you know, 16 years? 
Well, I will say, I think you're right. There's a lot of, uh, um, diversity can mean a lot of different things. Yeah. And so if I'm elected, I will be the first Latina elected to the Goleta City Council. Mm -hmm. I'll be the first mom of young kids elected to the Goleta City Council, which both of those, I think, really represent a big part of our city mm -hmm. and a perspective that we haven't had um, on our city council in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, we have district election. So that's the, you know, political playing field that we have to work with. And, you know, we, we both happen to live in district one. Um, so, you know, that's how the chips, you know, fell out. Um, and again, you know, I think that it's great that, you know, vo voters will have a choice. Voters know about, you know, both of us and, and candidates that will come up in, in other elections um, as we continue this transition, uh, this transition period towards district elections. Um, so, you know, I think that I, I bring, you know, a different uh, perspective on, on diversity. And I think it's great that the city, you know, continues to have a representation. And I think we can keep building on that. Um, not only, you know, at the city council level, but in looking at boards and commissions and advisory committees, um, that's another area that, you know, I want to make a contribution and really encouraging more uh, diversity on those spaces um, so that, you know, we can have more input, you know, even at those places. Not everyone wants to, you know, be in an elected office, but they still want to give back and they want to be involved. And those are often great opportunities for people to, to get involved. Yeah, those boards and commissions, <clears throat> definitely. And really, when we talk about diversity, it should be in hiring. It should be in appointments to those boards and commissions. Absolutely. It should be up and down the organization, not in just the um, the people who are elected. It's actually, statistically, we have more rep representation of uh, Latinos who are elected than we do actually employees in management. You know, I've looked at some of the data. And so it's just interesting, but yeah. that's one of the things I think about is, is that, uh, you know, the Latino community is so diverse. They're not all are, are liberal, progressive, the Democrats, some are moderates. Obviously we know that so many are conservative, you know, like generations above us. And so it's just interesting that the first Latina elected might oust the first Latino elected on the Galita council, but it is what it is. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. On the issue of diversity, Luce, can you talk, there's people watching and there's still people who say, why are we talking about this? Just let the best people win and let them serve. Why, why do we have to sort of, you know, they say we're not supposed to talk about race. So why do, why is there so much focus on diversity? Can you talk about why it's important for a Latina working mom to be on the council, not to, not to uh, talk about anyone else and why they're not important, but why is your perspective valuable? Yeah, and you know, I think so much of it boils down to acknowledging the reality that we 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 experience society and the world differently, um, and that's just a reality. Um, and I think a good um, e example of that, and you may have heard me share this story before, but you know, during COVID, you know, at, on the school board. You know, at the very beginning, the first, you know, real couple of months where we were, you know, totally locked down, everybody was, you know, making, making do with Zoom at home, <laughs> if that's what you had chosen to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was really proud of our district for moving so quickly and aggressively to do everything they could to help support families. Um, they, I knew they were, they were getting a lot of input from parents, whether that was from surveys that, you know, you and I took and responded to, mm -hmm. I know phone calls were, were made, emails were sent out. And of course people came to school board meetings. Um, you know, for the first time we had hundreds of people tuned in to our, our zoom, you know, school board meetings. Um, but I still felt like, there was there was something missing. There was a perspective that I wasn't hearing. Um, and you know, being a Latina and having grown up in a you know working class immigrant you know community and family, I knew that was a big part of our district. And I wasn't hearing you know if they were okay, if they needed additional support, what was going on. Um, and I know that things like responding to a survey on Parent Square or answering a phone call or email. Um, may not be uh, as easily accessible for some of those families. They may be a barrier. 
So I reached out to a teacher that lives in Old Town. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, she had actually come to a board meeting and said, you know, I th shared many of those same concerns. Um, so I, ca I called her up and I said, hey, what if I came down with you one evening and we walked the neighborhood um, and, and talked to parents? And she said, yes, let's do it. Um, so one night, you know, it was, you know, right in the thick of, of COVID and lockdown, um, I walked pretty much every street in Old Town and just reached out and talked to anybody who was out walking their dog or <laughs> walking with their kids or at the playground, whether it was at Nectarine Park or at Johnny Wallace Park um, and, and said, you know, I, I'm bilingual. And so was t saying, I'm loose. I'm on the school board. I'm really just out here with, you know, the maestra um, to, or the teacher to, to see, how are you doing? How is it going? Um, you know, what could the district do to support you more? Uh, what do you want to share with me? Um, and it was, it was really, really impactful. It's probably one of the most impactful things that I experienced over COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I heard so much appreciation for what the district was doing. I think they really felt like we were doing the best we could. But I heard over and over, you know, one story in particular that has never left me is one single mom who had a kindergartner who had to stay at home alone most of the day because mom had to work. Yeah. Um, and a neighbor was, you know, kind of coming in to check on him, make sure he, I mean, you know, he's having to navigate Zoom on his tablet on his own as a kindergartner. And I had a kindergartner at the same time. So it really touched me. Um, and just hearing her, you know, trying to survive um, and and hearing from so many others who who work at our local grocery stores and were worried about bringing COVID home, who were worried about how to you know put food on the table, who were worried about getting evicted, um, who didn't know where to get the you know most accurate information about COVID. You know they may not be signed up for every public health email <laughs> listserv you know that I may be on. Um, so I heard just over and over those kind of stories about how, you know, they felt like they were they were missing information um, and they were just working together to get by day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really lit a fire under me to say, you know, I need to do more. I need to figure out how I can help. Uh, you know, these these communities, they're part of my school family, you know, at Kellogg. Um, and what can we do? And of course, they're part of the district. Um, so we worked really hard to, as soon as we possibly could, safely have small cohorts of, of students from, you know, that had higher needs, you know, for being at home to be able to come on campus, uh, whether that was outdoors or in a classroom with really small numbers and just gradually build from there. And it was because I was very confident that as a district, we could do it and we could do it safely. And because the alternative was a little five-year-old boy sitting at home alone, uh, trying to do this on his own. Um, so that was really motivating for me. And it's things like that, that I think that perspective, that lived experience that I have and the willingness to, you know, go above and beyond and go out there and go directly to the people. Um, and then, and then really work to figure out what can we do? Um, I think that's the perspective that I would bring, uh, to the city council and the kind of work ethic and the kind of person I am, um, that, that I would bring to council. Yeah, and I and I have to say that for anyone watching who thinks that's like political talking points, the story you just told, um, it's not because I remember I was covering the Galita School Board at that time, and um, I remember watching you and and saying the things that you just said now during the zooms, um, at the board meetings and explaining those important perspectives and consistently pushing for a return to school and you know those debates that were happening and I, I definitely remember you uh, being an advocate for uh, families who could not afford pods for families right. who, could, who could not you know afford to um, just work from home or stay stay at home and and um, obviously we know that in a lot of families and specifically like Latin, Latinx households there's multiple generations and people mm -hmm. share and so it's uh, really tough uh, if there's, uh, if they can't go to school in terms of the impacts of what that means at home. So that's very real. And you did push for that. And Galita was the head of Santa Barbara 
in terms of returning to school and um, in person. So yeah, that's all legitimate and true. And, and, you know, you did a great job advocating for um, every, every kid, you know, in, in, in the, in the district at that time. And yeah, so then they went back to school and it was great. And my daughter, she, she wears glasses and she wore the mask and uh, she figured it out. It, it all, it all made, it all worked. Oh, go on. You know, um, it, the, the, the fogging up of the lenses and everything. And now she, and maybe your, your, your son too, and just this generation of the mask is always going to be part of them. Like I'm in a large group. I, I better wear my mask. You know, it's yeah, just part yeah. of what, what this generation is always going to be aware of. So it's not going to be a weird thing. It's an odd thing. It's like you yeah, wear your mask. Just, yeah, exactly in these settings. So that's a good transition. You're still serve on the Galena school board. Uh, we just yeah. returned back to school. Talk to me about sort of the feeling, the energy of being able to start another school year. Yeah, I think, you know, what's, what's really exciting, I think, especially for me, you know, so my son's in second grade, so we really not had a typical year. Um, yeah. And this really feels like a typical year. There's so many new things that I'm experiencing as a parent, like being able to walk you know, my son all the way to, you know, his classroom door, um, yeah. or even hanging around, you know, on campus before the bell rings in the morning. Um, you know, I'm, I'm loving that. Um, it's, it's so fun. You know, I walk him to school every morning, gets his breakfast, uh, big tip for any Galita parents watching. Don't, don't sleep on the breakfast. The breakfast is great. <laughs> so he picks up breakfast, you know, and he goes and plays with his friends. And I get to have some time to, you know, chat with parents. And, you know, that connection with other parents, I didn't know what I was missing mm. um, uh, until now. Um, and so that's been really great to talk to parents really outside of just my, our, you know, the immediate classroom. I think the classroom parents get to know each other a little bit more. But I'm seeing parents with kids, you know, that are starting kindergarten and hearing how they're doing. Um, so that's been really wonderful. I know, you know, and I hear that at other schools, too, yeah. um, that those parent connections, you know, have really been um, something they've missed the last couple of years. And they're hoping to do more, more events to bring, you know, parent families together to build community. Um, but otherwise, I'm hearing lots of positive things about the start to the school year. Uh, we've got back to school night coming up um, this next week, I think. Um, and so that will be exciting. Um, and yeah, you know, I think kids are, my son still carries his mask in his backpack. So he has it if he ever wants it, <laughs> if he wants yeah. to put it on. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're super excited, too, about the return of specialists. Um, so having, you know, PE, STEAM, art, um, you know, I think gardening is back at some of the schools and music. So I think that's really exciting for, for kids, too. Yeah, my daughter just moved into third grade, which means PE now is um, Monday, Tuesday. So okay. get it out of the way early in the week. So that's <laughs> good. Although they have to run a little bit longer now that they're in the, oh. right? so so there are trade offs and maybe maybe you can work with the Kona Ice Company because like this last Friday it was so hot I was like we want you guys back on campus because you know <laughs> they they were coming last year but they they couldn't be on campus they'd have to park nearby and we'd have to you know walk there or go there or get there somehow and um, I'm waiting for Kona Ice to be back in the park. Yes, they're great. Campus everybody's favorite yeah <laughs> exactly so yeah things seems to be going pretty well you know big picture in terms of you know glitty union school district and the start of the school year and everyone's really excited to have a normal year again um let's talk a little bit about you and your professional sure. uh situation for a long time or you worked at santa barbara city college for a few years as public information officer and you recently about a year ago moved to planned parenthood so can you talk about what your job is at Planned Parenthood Central Coast and what you do and just you know, it's a little bit about the work going on Roe versus Wade I mean you're you're at the center of the universe here yeah. with your job <laughs> yeah and I'll you know I'll add the disclaimer that I'm you know speaking you know as on my own I'm not talking you know on behalf of the organization uh, but yeah I've been really glad to be at Planned Parenthood California Central Coast uh, for a little over a year I'm the Vice President of Community Engagement, uh, which means I oversee the Education Department, the Public Affairs Department, 
and I do communications and marketing. Um, and uh, the affiliate covers the tri-county, so Slow County, Santa Barbara County, and Ventura County. Um, that's been really an um, exciting part of this new role is getting to know uh, communities um, outside of, you know, just maybe the south coast of Santa Barbara County or Santa Barbara County itself. Mm -hmm. um, that's been really great uh, to, to meet people and, and make those connections in other parts of the central coast as well. Um, you know, when I when I took the job um, after, you know, nearly six years at Santa Barbara City College, um, I was ready for, you know, something, a new challenge, um, you know, professionally. I never worked in the, you know, nonprofit uh, world. Um, I'd worked mostly actually with for cities. <laughs> That's how I started out my, my professional career. Um, and, and then, of course, higher education. Um, I knew, you know, a lot of the people that worked at Planned Parenthood, they were, you know, friends or people I respected, you know, really tremendously in the community. So I was really excited to, you know, make that move. Um, I didn't expect um, to be in a place where Roe v. Wade would be overturned. Mm -hmm. um, I knew, you know, from being really involved, you know, on, on the issues of reproductive rights, um, that there were continued attacks, you know, throughout the country to really chip away at rights. Um, so I knew that that was kind of the environment that I was go going into to really be a strong advocate for reproductive rights and justice. Um, but, you know, it really wasn't until the first few months where I really, you know, was immersed in what was coming that I really started to have to grapple with uh, the reality that this was likely coming. Um, and I think what was most uh, crystallizing for that was the you know passage of uh, Texas's SB8 bill in September of 2021. Um, I think that was really the clearest indication for me personally of where we were headed. Um, we, you know, I knew that that uh, Supreme Court case was going to be making its way this session, and and you know, I really felt that that was going to, um, that was going to overturn Roe, um, and you know, we saw that, you know, sadly happen, you know, this June, um, and it's one of those things where even though you expected it or you knew it was coming, I think especially after we saw that leak, leaked draft opinion in May it still felt like a gut punch. Like it still felt like, oh my gosh, now it's it's real. It really happened. It's in black and white and print. Okay. Um, and then of course, seeing how quickly um, in the weeks after that, we've seen state after state, you know, enact um, bans um, essentially. Um, and it's it's been a lot, um, but you know, I think for me, what I take great pride in and how I, you know, uh, cope with it or deal with it is again looking looking locally what can I do every day to make things better here make things better for the people that you know that Planned Parenthood serves um, in the communities we serve here how can we make things better how can we keep working collaboratively with our elected leaders here in California um, because otherwise it can I think feel so overwhelming um, that you can be kind of paralyzed by that. Um, so just focusing every day, what can we do today to make things better um, or to make some kind of progress or to help people um, is, is how I'm, uh, you know, coping with it. Um, and it's a great place to work, a great people. They're so dedicated. Um, and we have a lot of great support in the community, which, which is wonderful too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, California, of course, is a very progressive state, and uh, it's, you know, a place where um, people can feel as though their their opinions are being respected and heard, and they can have opportunities for reproductive health care and health care in general through Planned Parenthood. I wanted to ask you, Lucy, if you could just talk a little bit about Planned Parenthood for, you know, for, for viewers, for watchers. Some people tend to think, um, you know, they connote Planned Parenthood with abortion. And that's the only thing that and they get all fired up over that, you know, if they yeah. have a position. But Planned Parenthood is really about so much more than that. And can you just like, just for a couple of minutes, talk about that, that definition of when we think of Planned yeah. Parenthood, it's really about this. It's not just about this one thing that gets all the attention from people who, for whatever reason, you know, are, don't like Planned Parenthood, yeah. you know. 
Well, it's it's a healthcare provider. Yeah. And and I think the way that I can answer that question is just what it personally has has meant for me. Um so you know, I grew up in a, you know, Latino household. My my parents are are not conservative. You know, they're they're pretty they're pretty progressive. They're they're that unique group that has gotten, I think, more progressive as they've gotten older. Oh, okay. uh-huh. <laughs> like my, my dad was a big Bernie supporter, like oh. he was one of those Bernie Latino. Uh, older men. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, sexual and reproductive health was not something we talked about at home. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think my my parents knew how to talk about it, you know, with, with their three daughters. Um, so I didn't, we didn't talk about it at home. Um, I did not have really great uh, sex ed um, in high school. Um, so I was really unprepared um, and uneducated. Um, and, you know, I found myself, you know, in college, um, needing information, wanting to know how I could take care of myself, how could, you know, um, is birth control something that I should, you know, be on, Um, but not having any of that information. This is the early years of like, I didn't have before the iPhone, like Mm -hmm. before, you know, you had access to all that kind of information on your phone. Um, But I knew Planned Parenthood was a place at the time, you know, for, for women to go to, to, to get answers to their questions. Yeah. Um, so I called the, you know, whatever phone number it used to be back then to find an address <laughs> and, oh, okay. uh-huh. and, and got the address for, you know, the local Planned Parenthood, took a bus by myself to get there. And it was really the first time that I felt affirmed and respected in a healthcare like setting ever. Um, you know, I was treated with so much compassion um, and no judgment. You know, here I was, this, you know, Stanford student who was clueless about my body. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there was no, there was no judgment. There was no, no, they didn't, you know, they did, they didn't want me to feel ashamed. Um, and they provided me with information patiently um, and took care of me. And I have remembered that, you know, to this day. Um, and that's the, that's what Planned Parenthood means. Um, and it's what I've heard from so many other, you know, friends and community members. It's a place you can go to ask questions, to feel respected um, without judgment about topics that you may not necessarily feel comfortable talking about with maybe your primary care physician or with your family um, or with other people in your life, Um, whether that's, you know, cancer screenings or uh, STIs, um, STI treatment and testing, um, you know, and of course, you know, family planning and and making a decision about whether or not to end a pregnancy. Um, Those are, those are all the most, you know, uh, private and personal, you know, decisions about your health care and your life. Um, and Planned Parenthood is one of those places where you can go um, and be taken care of um, and be affirmed and, you know, have be, be really empowered to make your own decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's well said. That's really explains that context and that lens really well. And, you know, I think a lot of people who criticize Planned Parenthood, um, they may not need those services like that, 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 our medical needs are not uniform and, and the same for yeah. everybody. And so I think a lot of those voices you hear about um, what Planned Parenthood is, you know, are people who aren't going to be in a situation like you were in. So respect that people are in different places and they need different attention and different answers and different um, areas of feeling safe than, you know, some dude who's just like, no, you know, it's like, that's, that's not your experience. So maybe, maybe you don't have the expertise there to talk about that, you know? So yeah. I think that that's uh, it's good that we respect everybody's own paths and that there are organizations that can help you and other women um, in those situations because they're, they're very yeah. well, well needed. Um, and that's a good transition. You are a Stanford graduate. And I know that, <laughs> um, you know, you should be very proud of that. And I wanted to, talk to you about your your story a little bit and I know a little bit about your story because we've had a conversation in the past about it but um, I mean I think that as much as you can tell it and talk about what you had to experience growing up and the help you received in order to to go to college you are a role model every time you tell that story there's somebody who's going to hear it 
and see see themselves in you and they're going to be inspired and empowered so can you just talk a little bit about where you grew up and your story and you know what education meant to you and just that sort of uh you know the early years of Lucy yeah. <laughs> well I I think I do want to you know pay uh homage to you know um my my grandparents um my and i've i've had you know opportunities now that i'm a little older to unpack more of that family history and 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 learn more um so my grandfather was a bracero farm worker in the salinas valley in california in the 1940s um and you know we i've been able to you know he passed you know uh, in the 1950s um so you know i never grew up hearing you know knowing him of course um but you know trying to piece together you know what that experience must have been like um you know my mom has his bracero card uh you know with his picture and where he was um and so then you know my grandmother was younger than i am today when she was widowed um with five kids um in in mexico and she came here to los angeles on her own um, to work to provide for her kids. And um, my grandmother passed away a few years ago, but I was able to uner unearth this, I think, eighth or ninth grade uh, school project where you interviewed someone to do this oral history. Mm -hmm. And it's on this old cassette tape. <laughs> I've got to figure out how to get it on like a a more a more well preserved method digital yeah, but it's, yeah. but, right but it's her telling this story of coming here on her own um and doing all kinds of jobs like she and and part of me is like how much is this is is lore and legend and how much is true <laughs> um because she talks about you know working as a carpenter and working for a phone company and cleaning houses and working in a munitions factory <laughs> and all these really great stories. Um, but I think both of those really show you, um, you know, this heritage of working hard um, and, 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 and that being kind of the, the center of, of what you do in your life as you work hard to, to provide for your family. Um, my mom was the first woman in her family to go to college. Um, she went to UCLA, um, grew up in East LA, um, and was one of those first Chicano classes in the 1970s uh, to be at UCLA. So she's got some fun stories about what that was like. Um, and so then, you know, my, my, I have two younger sisters. Um, we mostly grew up in different parts of uh, Southeast LA County um, and primarily in Downey, which is a, you know, very much Mexican American, you know, community working class and kind of lower middle class it's it's I think they refer to it as that like second step um immigrant community mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a little bit more home ownership and things like that uh, but it was a great community to grow up in um and from the time I was a kid you know my parents instilled in us that education was um the 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 way that you could advance um, and the way that you could could open doors to 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 provide for 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 a life, um, and I think really importantly because I was one of three girls, my dad, who I always tease him and and tell him that he's the first feminist that I had in my family because from the time we were kids, he always told us, "I want you to be able to take care of yourself. Um, I don't want you to have to rely on a, a spouse." Um, or anyone else like you need to you know work hard you need to work twice as hard for half as much um, and and be able to stand on your own um, so I had that running in my mind like my whole like upbringing <laughs> and then being in school you know I really credit you know some key teachers in my life because not every teacher was supportive mm -hmm. um you know there's some of those stories too but I focus on the good and that was you know a handful of teachers really from elementary school all the way to high school who who believed in me and 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 helped me believe in myself um and didn't tell me no didn't put limits on on what I could do or what I could achieve 
Um, so when I think I've told you this before, when I saw Stanford as like a football team um, and I saw the pictures of the campus, which are beautiful, but didn't know, you know, that Stanford was this, you know, really hard school to get into. When I said that to a teacher in like ninth or 10th grade, um, Mr. Darstad and Mr. Glasser, my high school um, history teachers, when I told them I want to go to Stanford, they both said, OK, you know, let's let's figure out a plan for that. They could have just as easily laughed or chuckled or said like, oh, you know, let's have some backup schools or, you know, oh, that's a really hard school. Like, no, they said, OK, let's figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um, and so I believed that I that I could do it. Um, and we we made that plan. <laughs> you know, They're like, OK, that you've got to take every AP class and you've got to get a, you know as high a score on your SAT as you can. And it's going to cost a boatload of money. So you need to, you know, figure out some scholarships, um, you know, and I just, you know, worked hard and had their support. And of course, the support of my, my parents um, and, you know, and, and did it and made it. And it was, it was great. And it was a great experience being there. Yeah. The greatest gift that somebody can give is just making somebody realize that they can believe in themselves, you know, and yes, it absolutely. seems like it's like seems like such a little thing, but it's 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 remarkable how many people um, need validation outward in order to, to to feel like they can do something. And if you can yeah. help somebody understand in them, like I can do anything, that opens the doors to everything. And absolutely, your teachers were able to to do that to you, and that's one of those things where it's such a subtle thing had they chuckled had they laughed or had they say let's be realistic or any of those little things that people do that they don't mean to but they sort of just very subconsciously mm -hmm. and very quiet try to uh, minimize the the curiosity or ambition or or um, desire that people have that can have an effect and that's why it's always good to when people talk about their dreams to just hear them and say yes, yes you can do it because it's, it is possible but the, the first step to being possible is wanting it and if you feel like I shouldn't want it then it's never it's never going to happen so how was Stanford was it was it hard was it I mean, how did you work through it did you figure out you know did you get scholarships every year or tell me about how you were able to because one thing to get in it's one another thing to finish you know so, yeah, yeah yeah well I remember <laughs> you know another funny story is you know back then um you know you get the big envelope or you get the small envelope <laughs> at home mm -hmm. um and I remember I, I still remember driving up to my driveway um, coming home from school and seeing the big envelope, uh -huh. like, like right in front of the door, the mailman hadn't put it like shoved it in the mailbox, <laughs> like he put it right in front of the door. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, of course, I was so excited. And, and when my dad came home, and I told him that I had gotten into Stanford, I, he swore, like, I won't repeat what he said. But he, his first reaction was, oh, you know, and, yeah. and freaked out. Um, and, and he, and he immediately also said, okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. Right. Because we knew how expensive it was. Um, and I think, you know, whether it was being fortunate or just being a good advocate, my mom was on the phone with that financial aid office, like as much as she could be to say, what can we do? What, you know, what scholarship can she apply for? Um, my dad was a, a mail carrier. Um, and his uh, union was the first one that gave me a, a scholarship um, when he went and asked, you know, if the union did, had, you know, college scholarships um, and, you know, just pieced, pieced it together. Um, Stanford really came through and, you know, gave me a lot of merit based um, grants and scholarships to help uh, help make it possible yeah. um, and help make it possible not only for you know my parents of course had to pay for some of it and I took on some loans but so that it wasn't something that was going to be you know a huge burden for me um, you know I've, I've, I'm still paying them off but it's mm -hmm. but it's doable um, right and so I really credit them as a private institution they can do things that other colleges can't I completely recognize that mm -hmm. um, but they made it possible um, I worked two or three jobs the entire time that I was there um, you know on-campus jobs you know whatever I could I could find and, and make work so that was hard 
Um, and I really pushed myself, you know, I, I double majored um, and was often taking 20 or 21 units every quarter um, oh. the whole time I was there. And then of course, really involved with a lot of stuff um, as a student. Um, I was first elected to something as, a, as an undergrad to their undergraduate senate mm. um, and wow. just worked hard. I mean, I felt I think I felt like I had worked so hard to get there that I wanted to take advantage of every possible experience and opportunity I could in the four years I was there. Yeah. Uh, and I've made lifelong friends. And yeah, it was hard academically, uh, but it was also a wonderful, wonderful place. Yeah, that, that's great. And I like what you said about, just to go back to it, you were told you have to work twice as hard for half as much. And I think that that's something that that we do. And it's also yeah. something that we do that we don't complain about. We don't advertise. We we just do it because we're, yeah. we're humble. You know, and I'm using yeah. the we here, you know, in terms of the um, you know, Mexican American, Latino community, um, you know, my experience. Um, we work really hard because our family members worked really hard. Like they had multiple jobs nonstop, constantly. And it was just the norm. And you didn't go there yeah. and like tell people, I have to work hard. You just did it because you had to do whatever you have to do for your family, you know. And and in Absolutely. your case, it's all worth it. Cause what are the what's why is everybody working so hard? So the next generation of kids can go to school and have it a little bit easier and better than they did you know that's yes it's all about the kids so that's really uh inspiring story that, that you share you know so um this has been a really good conversation loose um i just want to wrap yeah. up kind of kind of going full circle you've been walking on a lot of doors all summer and you're going to continue to do it where we have september we have labor day it's sort of the unofficial kickoff you know to yeah. the, i guess the official you know kickoff kind of. <laughs> Um, but it gets real serious, you know, after Labor Day in terms of winning. And so uh, can you just send us off with uh, just again, you know, why why you're the right choice and, you know, what you want to do for Galita? Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm. this is a big, you know, group uh, effort in many ways. Um, you know, of course, I'm out there, you know, sharing my message, but my husband is yeah you know, canvassing with me. You know, he's uh, I call him my like ca chief canvasser slash photographer slash you know canvas lit you know packet but you know person. Um, we're all we're all pitching in um, because you know I think we as a family you know are really invested in this too. Um, you know I'm going to be spending as much time as I can between now and uh, election day just talking to voters and you know if they don't already know me you know getting to know them and getting to know what I want to do you know as a council member and again you know I think for me it's. I want to deliver on, you know, the services that we expect as residents for our community. Um, I want to get things done. Um, I want to see projects, you know, come to fruition. I think that's the great part about working in local local issues is actually getting to see things, um, you know, done and in place. Um, I want to do that. Um, I want to help work with neighborhood neighbors to plan for our future, especially in our district. Like, what's the future? How do we, how do we make sure Lake Los Carneros is is in a good place moving forward? How do we, you know, address, you know, as I've mentioned, you know, bicycle and pedestrian networks, um, you know, across the district and across the city. Um, we've got the foothills right up, right up here. You know, the holiday fire was just a block or two away from me. Um, and it was, you know, really alarming for our neighborhood to just experience that threat of wildfire up close and personal. Um, so how can we be best prepared for that? So I feel like I am, you know, the, the best choice to move us forward um, into the future um, and that I'm going to be out there, you know, get wanting your input um, as residents. I'm going to be really proactive um, and accessible, you know, to, to residents. Um, and I think that's what we all want in, in a local uh, representative, someone that you know, someone that you, you feel comfortable calling up and explaining an issue and someone who's going to follow through. Um, to get back to you um, and explain how things are working. Um, and that's what who I want to be as a council member. And so I'm going to be focused on getting that message out to, to voters um, and working with volunteers to knock on those doors and um, really look forward to it. It's been really great so far. 
Great. And I don't know if Lake Los Carneros is in your uh, your uh, district one. It is. Here. But you, an unofficial act of business, a, 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 a off the record request, if you will. No, <laughs> um, there's a tree and there's a tree swing and it's, you know, there for years and it's on and off. And, and um, right. Most recently I've been there, it like broke, it snapped, you know? And so I think it's like a neighbor or somebody in the area. Oh, I, think, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and oh. they'll fix it. And then, you know, anybody can come by and swing on the tire and it's really fun, like unofficial sort of thing. Probably yeah. not entirely. No, it's totally safe, you know, but it's not really like a city thing, but it is a, a neighborhood thing. So, you know, maybe you can take a little stroll there. Or yeah, it's ways, those but... little things that make <laughs> such a big difference for, for people. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and I I, lo- I grew up in Goleta, so I love uh, um, uh, Lake Los Caneros and all these little oh, yeah. places around town. It's, it's hard for me to see it as a district because as districts, because it's like, it's all so small and I, I know, it, you know? Yeah. So, but but it is what it is and we do get a, a new kind of representation that way so yeah. there's many positives to that but thanks a lot Luis, Luis Reyes Martin for uh, taking the time to talk on this this hot afternoon and uh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> heat wave so um good luck to you and I'm sure I'll yeah, see you down thank the road you. yeah thank I'm you. off to actually a neighborhood uh barbecue slash you know hosing down all the kids who are hot and sweaty oh good all right <laughs> so that'll, that'll be, be fun. fun yeah that's that those are the fun times okay yes thank exactly. you Liz. thank you okay thank you so much